We're the UK's leading uh, think tank and policy research institute on public policy matters with a focus on actual recommendations to improve and achieve uh, British prosperity. Uh, today we have what uh, I like to think is one of the most important and exciting panels at the conference this weekend uh, with an incredibly distinguished panel to talk about the future of British energy. Uh, as folks know, uh, the UK was once a leader in civilian nuclear engineering. Uh, we had the world's first civilian nuclear power station uh, built at Calder Hall in Cumbria in 1956. Uh, by 97, the nuclear energy was providing over a quarter of the nation's power supply. Uh, we're now at a time of transition. As older generations come offline, we have a new generation of nuclear energy ready uh, to hit the grid, and we have very ambitious plans for a future uh, that is clean, that is affordable, uh, and that is in large part powered by nuclear. Uh, today, we have a very distinguished panel to discuss some of these issues. First and foremost, we have Jacob Rees Mogg, who's the MP for Northeast Somerset and the Secretary of State for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy. Uh, we have Mark Hartley, he's a Technical Director of Hinkley Point C. Uh, to my left, we have Julia Pike, who's the Director of Financing for Sizewell C and the very generous sponsors of today's panel. Thank you kindly. And lastly, we have Tom Sampson, uh, the Chief Executive Officer of Royce Royce uh, sm Small Modular Reactors. Thank you all for being here. Um, today I'd like to start with, um, with the Secretary of State. Um, it's certainly been a very exciting couple of weeks since your entry into the uh, new government. Uh, you've confronted uh, what could be described as the worst energy crisis uh, of our lifetimes and uh, one that could get much worse. Uh, at the same time, you've articulated a very clear and exciting vision for what energy security can hold for the UK and a role uh, for nuclear energy to play in that. Uh, can you speak to some of these issues and, and how you see the sector moving forward over the next couple of years? Um, th well, thank you very much, and thank you for um, Politics Exchange organizing another excellent event at the party conference and keeping up its track record for interesting, informative um, activities. Um, indeed, I think uh, where Policy Exchange leads, governments very often follow. Um, but I'm very conscious that on this panel, I may be the Secretary of State, but all the expertise is in other parts of the panel, because I've been doing this for three weeks, and we've got industry experts who've been doing it in some cases for decades. And that may be slightly the point, that um, uh, the length of time it takes to do things is so long that you can be involved in decades for a single project. And that's where the government needs to get a grip, effectively. That Nuclear power has an absolutely central role in any future strategy for energy within the United Kingdom. How can I say that so authoritatively? Well, first of all, it's safe that the techniques around nuclear power, the um, work that has been done over decades now, means that nuclear power is a very safe form of energy, very well understood, and is able to be worked with by people who understand how to use it. So that's important. It's also secure that our nuclear power can't suddenly um, be taken away from us because there's a war in Ukraine. So evil dictators cannot stop us getting our power supply, as long as we make sure there are proper protections uh, built in and there are various things that we need to do to ensure that security of supply as um, uh, we, we make sure more nuclear power comes on board. So it's there, it's permanent, and it provides base load. I, I mean, this is very simple stuff, and the other members of the panel will look at me with horror that I am giving you the ladybird guide to nuclear power, <laughs> but I'm going to do it anyway, because the great thing about a nuclear power station is that once you switch it on, it stays on, and it runs and runs and runs and runs and runs, and very occasionally you have to switch it off for a little bit of repair, and then it runs and runs and runs again for about 60 years. And actually, it may go even longer than 60 years, but I, I, I think Hinkley and Sizewell, are, we're looking at 60-year lifespans. Um, so, I don't know, I'll be around in 60 years, I'll be 110, I'll probably be cri pretty crotchety by then, but, but um, it would be quite fun to see if people are then saying that the power stations will go on longer. But that's great, because other forms of power that are coming in that are contributors to net zero, I'm afraid you don't switch on and allow to continue running. They stop running when the wind doesn't blow. Um, in Somerset, of course, the sun shines always, so we're very lucky when it comes to solar power because we have an idyllic Garden of Eden-style climate. 
but there are the less favoured parts of this septed isle where occasionally the rain clouds form and therefore you don't get as much solar power as you were hoping for. Indeed, you get night uh, as well, and the moon is not as effective um, as the sun in providing solar power for obvious reasons. And so nuclear power is just fundamental. There is no way we can um, get to net zero or even have an intelligent electricity strategy without nuclear, net zero or not, because it's such a good fundamental base, which is why we started doing it in the 1950s uh, in the first place. And you don't really get huge price fluctuations. You basically know what the price will be from the construction cost. There's a little bit of fuel, but it's not, it's not, it's not the same level of fluctuation as you get uh, with oil, gas, coal, and other things. And then there's what bits do you have? And this is, I think, really interesting because we've got on the panel people representing the big nuclear power stations. And these are really important because they provide gigawatts of power. I think Hinkley C is going to be 7% of our current power needs that's when it's correct. up and running. And that, that, from one power station, that's a really big effort to provide what we need. So that's really important. And there is always going to be a place for the big nuclear power stations. Then what Rolls-Royce and others are doing on modular nuclear power sets, and this is again back to the Ladybird book on nuclear power, the modular ones can be like Lego kits. You, you stick them together and they produce electricity and you produce it nearer to where you need it and ideally uh, with a shorter time horizon to installing it and because it's modular, Rolls-Royce can produce it and export it around the world and others of exactly the same basis and so you reduce costs massively because instead of doing everything once and then having to design a new thing for the next time, you have, it's, it's the Model T Ford of nuclear power. Now, there are various types. Um, some are called small modular nuclear reactors. Rolls-Royce's small is actually enormous, but I'm leaving that to one side. Uh, there are ones that are very, very small. And that I find fascinating because you may have very small that provides the nuclear energy you need for one energy intensive factory and suddenly you've got your energy intensive factory entirely with clean energy uh, overnight. Well, not overnight, it takes some time, but you, you get the general point. So I'm really excited about nuclear energy. I think it is one of the most important parts of my portfolio and I think it's one of the things that whatever level of green you are, you can agree that nuclear power is a good thing unless you're one of those people who simply wants us to be cold and poor and become cave dwellers and you don't want any energy at all. And if you're in that category, I'm so sorry, there's nothing I can do to help you move to Brighton and vote for Caroline Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Secretary. Um, Mr. Hartley, to you. Uh, you're currently working on what is one of Europe's largest infrastructure projects. Uh, it's been going on for a bit of time, and we're, we're fast approaching the finish line. Can you tell us a bit more about the project, what the journey was like, and uh, some of the lessons you've learned along the way? Okay. Thank you very much indeed. So it's a pleasure to be here, to be able to sort of share some thoughts with you about nuclear and the development of the country, especially having spent sort of 25 years of my career doing so. So as you may know, Hinkley, of course, is the only new nuclear plant in construction in Britain. And as was just said, it will, when complete, generate 7% of the UK's electricity. So we're heavily focused on being able to deliver that, recognising that, of course, the UK really does need that power, especially with an energy crisis. There are 3,300 British businesses that are at work with 22,000 workers across the whole country helping us to build the project. I'm really proud that we've been able to create 1,000 apprenticeships, boosting uh, not just apprenticeships, but social mobility and productivity in the areas around the project. And I hope that people will come pay us a visit. You'd be very welcome. Looking at the history, the UK once led the world in developing civil nuclear. Uh, British ingenuity and British workers constructed a fleet of nuclear power stations that helped power the country. First, the now retired Magnox reactors were built in the 50s and 60s, and they were followed in the 70s and 80s by the advanced gas cooled reactors. Ones like Hinkley Point B, which is also in Somerset and ceased operating only very recently in the summer after 46 years of operation, of being the most productive nuclear power station the country's ever had. 
Our remaining advanced gas-cooled reactors are due to be closed by the end of the decade. So new nuclear is a big focus. Size will be the UK's sole pressurised water reactor at present. Started generating in 95 and is the only one in the current fleet that will be producing energy beyond the end of the decade. So the challenge has been the long gap in nuclear construction. Starting up a new nuclear capability in Britain after a gap of over 20 years has been a huge challenge. And it's something now that with building on our operational experience, uh, the partnership and development with the supply chain that we've been able to do. So where is Hinkley Point now? Well, the project is 58% complete by activity. As buildings rise out of the ground, we're moving into the next phase of construction, which will be all about fitting the pipework, the cabling, the heating and cooling systems. World first lifts were carried out uh, this summer, placing 5,000 tonne heads that the water will be sucked through to the power station. These things were set down in the Bristol Channel within centimetres of accuracy. The nuclear pressure vessel construction is complete. Final tests and inspections are currently being done, ready for it to be delivered at the beginning of next year. And we now plan to lift the iconic head on the power station by the middle of next year. So what have we learned? Well, a great deal, as you can imagine. You need to invest in people and skills and build a supply chain that can deliver quality needed for nuclear. A workforce and a supply chain that will benefit all of the future nuclear build projects. You need design approved for the use in the country that you're going to build in. And you need to be able to repeat it with as fewer changes as possible. That's something we didn't do really with the AGRs. I'm afraid I can say this as an engineer. We allowed the engineers to keep fiddling, trying to make it better and better. And it just made construction harder. So some key learning from our history there. We also need policy right across government to be aligned to delivery. And that's why we support the growth plan's ambition to accelerate the delivery of infrastructure. Of course, we need protection for communities and the environment and a balanced planning system. But it is our experience that getting essential infrastructure built in Britain is still too hard. There's a labyrinth of environmental regulations that can be interpreted by di differently by different departments. And this means that changes can take months or even years to gain approval, and that will really challenge the delivery of a project. So we're very much looking forward to working with government to address some of these issues. So Hinkley C is a fabulous project for an engineer like me. As was said a moment ago, its plan is to operate for 60 years delivering safe, reliable energy for the UK. And I have every expectation that it will go beyond that to operate for at least 80 years. So we've done a huge amount to get uh, British nuclear build and the industry back in business, really. And it's now essential that other projects have the opportunity to follow that and make use of that industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Ms. Pike, um, you are at the next stage of uh, Britain's nuclear journey uh, at Sizewell C. You guys have done a tremendous amount of work out there uh, with much more to come. Can you tell us a bit more about the project, the future plans for Sizewell, and, and how you plan to make uh, British nuclear a little bit more British? <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, taking advantage of all the work of Mark and colleagues on Hinkley, we've developed Sizewell as a copy. So it's going to be an identical above-ground copy. There's going to be no engineering, and it's very, very dull for engineers. But it's good for the consumer. So we're going to develop Sizewell as Hinkley units three and four. Hinkley has two units, one and two. And it's going to have very high UK content. It will be over 90% through life. So we save time and money by taking the design from Hinkley, and we benefit from all of the experience, and sometimes a very painful experience, Mark has described, of consenting and the experience of building. And we'll have a very experienced supply chain. We have been able to move the supply chain from one project to another, with the government recognising that the benefits of experience vastly outweigh the benefits of um, strict compliance with the notion that competition is always a great thing in the supply chain. So Unit 2 at Hinkley shows us that building Sizewell C will be quicker with lower risk of cost overruns. So this is all the same. What's different? So what's going to be different is it's the other side of the country. 
some different site conditions. But the main difference is that we're changing the ownership and we're changing the way it's financed. So Hinkley is majority owned and financed by EDF, who bought the UK's operating nuclear power industry in 2009 after Nuclear Electric, which had previously been part of the public sector, was privatised as British Energy. Sizewell is not going to be majority owned by EDF. It's going to be owned by the government, and the government will have ordinary shares and it will have a special share, which will um, control share transfers on national security grounds. EDF will keep about 20%, and then we're looking to attract other investors, and we're looking to raise debt from UK pension funds and insurers, and we want to create a virtuous circle where um, British pension fund and insurance money creates UK jobs, UK energy production to keep everybody warm and keep business in business, and that in turn funds British pensions. So to enable this model, government's done a lot of really, really good policy work. So the government's introduced the RAB model, the regulated asset-based model. That's what's used for national grid transmission, amongst other things. And instead of contracts for difference, which is what Hinkley has, which put all the risk of development costs onto shareholders, even though, as Mark was explaining, quite a lot of risk to shareholders actually comes from the consenting regime, which is out of the control of the developer. But the RAB model reduces both the cost of money and, um, and this reduces consumer bills because it shares the cost overrun risk between the developer and the consumer. So the developer remains heavily incentivized but not bearing all of the risk. So the right amount of nuclear in the system reduces costs for consumers. If Hinkley were on today, it would save around four billion pounds. Sizewell's going to be cheaper, and so it will save consumers even more. And people have a general misconception. They don't really understand the difference between something being expensive to build, nuclear is, and whether or not it actually lowers consumer bills. Nuclear does. Why? Because it's cheaper than a huge overbuild of renewables, very long-term storage, and dependence on um, gas, essentially. So Hinkley's helped Sizewell hugely. How can we, Sizewell and Hinkley, help the future programme? So we developed lots of skills, skills like high-end welding. You know, they, they weren't in the UK. There hasn't been a high-end welding industry in the UK. It's been imported. Hinkley's been developing high-end welders. We'll go further. We'll develop more high-end welding skills, and hopefully those will be of use to Tom and his colleagues in the future programme. We've been the pathfinder, both for the contract for difference and now for the regulated asset base model. We're establishing a market for financing, so we're going out actually advertising nuclear to the financial community, making all of the ESG arguments and helping people get comfortable with it. And we are, of course, the pathfinder for the only 240 or so consents that we need. And so again, the future program can learn from our consenting journey. And what we want to do, and what we'd ask government, is to, is to work together to achieve a better balance. You know, we, we are building Sizewell because we care hugely about the environment. It's a project for the environment. But we need a better balance between being able to get on with building something which the country needs and the time it takes to get through all of the consenting to do so. So we don't at all want to reduce environmental protection. We want to be able to build faster. In Germany, where they've recognized the intense need for um, liquid natural gas be to, because they're not going to get Russian gas, they have reduced the build time for their liquid natural gas ships from 10 years to 10 months, and they have done that in part by um, reducing the consenting requirements because of the national need. So uh, I think finally I'd just say that we're also very keen to develop other uses for nuclear, which will also be of benefit to the future um, program, so we are going to re release heat and sell heat from Sizewell for the first time in UK nuclear, and that's going to enable us to help make hydrogen and to power direct air capture and to have nuclear associated with the full range of the way the UK's energy system develops. Thank you. Uh, Tom, when uh, folks think of uh, Innovation Nation in the UK, they, some of them think of uh, Rolls-Royce SMR. Uh, you certainly have uh, some tremendous ambitions for the future of British energy security. Can you tell us a bit more about those plans and how we can help realize them uh, over the next couple of years? Certainly, yeah, and I'd like to well, firstly thank Policy Exchange and EDF for sponsoring the event and inviting us to come along and speak uh, and to recognize the, the great work that EDF have done in keeping nuclear on the agenda uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, and in particularly the work that Julia has been leading in terms of financing nuclear, which is a tough 
tough thing to solve, but I think we're, we're finding more and more ways to, to overcome those barriers. And to hear from the Secretary of State exactly the kind of key messages around the importance of nuclear is, is so uh, heartwarming to, to us in this industry that are trying our best to, to deliver solutions, be it at Hinkley, Sizewell, or with our, our Rolls-Royce uh, SMR uh, technology. And we're also, as you say, from an innovation perspective, We've already secured a significant amount of support from the UK government last November with the single largest grant uh, through UKRI for a technology company. And we've taken that £210 million and levered it up to bring equity in. Uh, so we've got the best part of £500 million to help develop what is effectively a new UK sovereign technology. For the first time in many decades, we've now got a British nuclear solution that we can not just deploy in the UK, but more importantly, help deliver clean, affordable energy in many, many markets around the world and create uh, an export product that we can be, we can be proud of. Uh, and that technology really is <coughs> focused on bringing nuclear to market at pace. So we're using proven technology. We're not creating a different type of nuclear reactor or different type of fuel. It's very similar to, uh, the, in fact, it's the same PWR technology at Hinkley, and it'll be at Sizewell, and is already at Sizewell B, um, and it's using standard fuel. And our goal is to try to innovate by building it in a factory. That allows us to do things in parallel, do things much faster, and reduce much of the construction complexities that otherwise affect a delivery in this country and elsewhere, and by making it small enough so it can be built in a factory, assembled inside a site factory, and be isolated from the weather, so we can look to deploy this technology at a much faster pace than we would if we were just doing it in a traditional construction method. So that's, that's what we've tried, uh, been working on for the last seven years in, in Rolls-Royce, uh, and we've now brought in new partners with us from the US, Constellation, the largest nuclear fleet operator in the US, and our ambitions will hopefully take us to that part of the world as well in the future. We've brought in Sovereign Wealth Fund from Qatar and the oil and gas uh, Perenco from France, uh, their family wealth fund, to help us uh, in this current phase. Um, and, and really what our goal is now is to to start to look at how we can deploy the technology in the UK and, as Julia said, look to employ many of the same solutions in terms of funding and financing, combining some government support but more private capital, accessing uh, eventually the RAB model, but trying to do it in a way that allows us to get a green light to start earlier than would otherwise be possible. So that green light to start can allow us to commit to an end date that is hopefully uh, as close to 2030 or 2031 as humanly possible. That date, as we've already heard, will largely be dependent on our ability to build the factories and produce the product, but a big part of it is influenced by the planning and the permitting processes where I think in the time of energy crisis, there is an urgency to revisit the priorities and find ways to prioritize uh, projects that will improve energy security and, as Julia said, benefit consumers by bringing more nuclear on the grid quicker and that that should be put into context along with the other important uh, planning considerations so we can actually get to the end point and, importantly, with all these nuclear programs, deliver wealth creation and economic growth, which is very much part of the government's agenda today. So we're really keen to play our part in doing that by bringing forward a solution that <clears throat> can be employed in the UK, but more importantly, exported around the world. And we're seeing that demand for international exports uh, increasing every week. Uh, and the opportunities for us as a country now to also bring to markets in Central Europe, in Asia, in North America, a technology that can help us as well on the world stage influence our own energy diplomacy in certain key markets, I think is, is a vital a tool in our toolkit now in the UK. Um, so that's where we're focusing our attentions right now. We're very excited by what that means. We're very excited to see the government as well with Great British Nuclear set an ambition for 24 gigawatts of nuclear by 2050. We want to try and do more to deliver as much of those megawatts by 2030 as possible. We have many options with our size of technology to deploy this on the existing nuclear estate where those communities are hugely supportive and indeed pushing very hard for more, uh, more economic activity from nuclear. And so within that nuclear estate, within the NDA sites, within the sites that were previously designated for many large projects that haven't gone ahead, we could easily deploy more than 30 of our SMRs in the UK, each one 
large enough to power a city the size of Leeds. So uh, they are, as you rightly point out, Secretary of State, rather large uh, for a small modular reactor, but that's as much megawatts as we can fit into a solution that can still make use of that factory build philosophy. So I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you for the chance to, to contribute today. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, a recurring question we're facing is a one of uh, local support, uh, depending on which energy resource we're talking about. Sometimes people get really excited, sometimes they get very disappointed. Um, I'd like to bring a question to the panel on, is there support in the UK for nuclear energy? Um, how are we doing with local communities, and is there anything we could do to build that support and bring it further to the level we need? Mark, could we start with you? Yeah, I mean, I'll perhaps start with, I mean, I think there is support. Support has, has grown as we've talked about these things. I think the local communities are key and you know we continue to do a lot of work talking to those people, building that relationship so that people understand and are a part of those projects. I think in Somerset we've had a, you know great work with the local community. People have seen a lot in terms of the jobs, the economic improvement that that brings, uh, the benefit for their future and that in turn helps them see the benefits of, of where that nuclear power will be for the future. Uh, Secretary, you've said you'd be happy with some fracking in your backyard. How would you feel about an SMR on the estate? It's even better. Excellent. Yes. We're, 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 I, I don't know if I'll cave one of the Rolls Royce versions. I think that would take up a bit too much space. Um, uh, but uh, Hinkley Point is in Somerset. It's, it's um, not immediately next to my part of the, my constituency. But people in Somerset are really keen on Hinkley Point. Hinkley is really popular. It's brought a huge amount of money. Uh, into the county and skills and, and you all know I adore Somerset I'm completely obsessed by Somerset um, and always have been from childhood I was very anti-Avon when that was brought in um, but Somerset is a misunderstood county people think of it as being really quite prosperous but it isn't actually it's just that bit too far from London uh, it hasn't um, got the spread over of um, uh, the home counties that have made Wiltshire and Gloucestershire much more prosperous. It, there are bits of Somerset that are quite away from Bristol that's quite a prosperous part of the world. The, my constituency has the old Somerset coal fields and that's long standing been an area of deprivation. And Hinkley's brought an enormous amount of money into the county and phenomenal skills. Did you say a thousand, um, thousand apprentices? Thousand apprentices. And so I, th I think the reputation of nuclear energy in Somerset is incredibly high. And it was, dare I say, very good government policy to put nuclear power stations where they already existed. And that really helps. The same is true with Sizewell, because if you've got one by you, you're keen on it. But, now there's not an announcement of government policy, and I'm going to say it very quietly, because you're all going to be shocked, and it's those of you who are standing up, be warned. I think we should copy the French. Um, uh, <laughs> because as I understand it, if you live near a nuclear power station in France, you get free electricity. And that's great. Because then what's there to then? Then I'll have two in my garden if they'll fit. <laughs> free electricity. I might get free electricity for my children as well. Um, so I, I, I think you want to recognise that things you do that are in the national interest must benefit those who make the sacrifice for the national interest. That seems only to be fair. Just one other thing I want to add. Did I really hear 240 separate regulatory approvals? I've been saying all conference 140. I'm so sorry that I got the figure wrong because I was out by 100 extra approvals. No wonder everything takes so long, and that is a real challenge for government. Um, Sizewell has probably done more work on building local support and community consultation than any other project in England, and not, if not in all of Europe. Uh, what's been your experience with that, and how are people feeling about Sizewell seeing the local communities? We did an ICM poll, which we published last week, which shows 61% local community support, 24% opposed. And for a mega project which has been consulting people for eight years and hasn't yet delivered benefit, that is a really fantastic result. Um, People do support it, as the Secretary of State says. Sizewell has two power stations there already, Sizewell A and Sizewell B. And of course, there are always people who don't support it, and we respect that, but they are in the, in the minority now. I think that you know, the more nuclear gets going, the more people will support it. So in Finland, where Olkiluto is turned on, it's putting out full power. It's late, but it's a great thing. It, um, support for nuclear is now running at 74%. So I think the more, the more of this we see... Um, 
coming online and being successful, then I think the more public support will grow. I, th I think, actually, the media has always overstated the extent of UK public opposition to nuclear. It's always been pretty stable. that a third of people like it, a third of people really don't like it, and a third of people don't really care. And you know, th this, is, this is how it is. And even when films like Chernobyl are shown, it's sort of there's a blip for a day or two, but it goes back to, to settling naturally. People aren't that interested on the whole. Tom, do you have anything to add in particular? You know, are, are foreign nations potential export markers? Are they eager for British SMRs? Is there an appetite for that? Or are they looking at other alternative sources? Um, well, they are, they're obviously looking at other, and there's other competitors. There's a wide range of SMRs in the marketplace from, as Secretary of State states, small to one megawatt, five megawatts, and we're at the other end of the spectrum. And there is competition, particularly from the US, and EDF have their own SMR design in New World back in France as well. But in the, in the 50 hertz market in the world, you know, two thirds of the world is 50 hertz, and North America is 60 hertz. Uh, we think we're, we're in a really uh, lead position. We're in the GDA with the regulator here in the UK. We hope that will be a high water mark that will help us when we export. We're supporting the IAEA and nuclear harmonization initiatives to make it easier to bring a regulated design in one country to another country. Um, but yeah, we, we see huge demand. And we think that uh, we, I benefit tremendously from the Rolls-Royce brand, uh, and that is a recognition of Rolls-Royce's commitment to their sustainability journey that they've invested in this technology for the last seven years. Uh, and that brand has a huge amount of influence and power when we go into any market in the world. And so that's a really great uh, advantage we've got. But the honest truth is, until we can point to deployment of the first projects here in the UK, Every other customer around the world asks us, where are you building the first one in the UK? And while we've got grant funding and we're in the GDA, until we can demonstrate that we've begun deployment here, it makes it very hard for us to secure those orders. But we're hoping that we can work with the government uh, to realize those economic growth and wealth creation opportunities here that will help unlock uh, those exports. Wonderful. I'd like to take it to the floor now. If you could uh, please first address yourself and where you work. Uh, and more importantly, ask a question and not a statement. That would be greatly appreciated by everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, gentleman up front in the white, and then the fellow right behind him, my colleague, Harry. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Havid Hughes, and I run the all-party parliamentary group on small modular reactors. Um, one of the issues that keeps coming up and has been mentioned today is the time and the number of consents it takes to get any of these uh, designs or reactors approved. And I'd like to know more about what can be done to tackle this, because that seems to be the single biggest problem preventing the deployment of this technology. Thank you. And behind you. Hi, I'm Harry Halem, Foreign Policy and Defense at Policy Exchange right here. Um, so the strategic argument for nuclear is abundantly clear, given the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the pressure that we're already feeling in this country eight months into the war. However, as much as we can produce a variety of elements of nuclear in country, as much as we can source it from friendly countries, there's the question of uranium refining and enrichment. Russia maintains something like 40 to 50 percent of uranium refining and enrichment capacity in the world as of 2019, 2020, when the last study was done. That may have changed in the last couple of years. However, the way these things go, it takes a long time to build out capacity. What can the government do, naturally this question is directed to the Secretary of State, to ensure that the UK, either independently or in concert with allies and partners, is able to maintain all elements of the nuclear supply chain to a reasonable degree of security? Thank you. Secretary, could we start with you? Yeah, yeah certainly. Um, first on the issue of consents, there is a balancing act. 240 is clearly too many. But we've got the support in Somerset and we've got the support at Sizeball from local communities. Partly that's because they feel they have the opportunity to make their concerns known and they get good answers for their concerns. So how do we get this balancing act right? Clearly it needs to be sped up. Sizeball is three and a half years of approvals broadly. We started consulting eight years ago. Eight years ago, so it may be another three and a half years. I certainly got that figure from somewhere. Um, it, the, the, we need it now. Now, Rolls-Royce is slightly different because you've got to build the factories, and therefore we need to get the consents going in parallel with you building the factories. That gives us a bit of time. But once your factories are built, then we need to be able to say this is where a modular nuclear reactor is going because you need to have the continuity 
of production to get the economic benefits of making it modular. And if every one takes years to get, dust has gathered in the factory, skills have been lost before you do the next one. So it's getting that, that balance right. Um, on friendly countries, friendly countries must work together. That's the answer to this. Uh, it, it, I, I'll give you a slightly different example because it, it's, um, it's relevant. Uh, and that is on um, rare earth metals, that the Chinese basically destroyed the market by undercutting everybody, and Australia and South Africa both produced rare earth metals. They're not as rare as the name implies. Um, and the mines closed because they were uneconomic, because the Chinese were undercutting. Therefore, we became completely dependent on the Chinese. There is now work being done, discussions being had, as to how uh, the Western world, though not all it is Western, can cooperate and collaborate to make sure that it's economic to run these mines. We must do the same with uranium and with uranium enrichment. We've got to make sure we have secure supplies. That, that, that is the big lesson, isn't it? of what's happened in the last six months. The overwhelming lesson, put everything else to one side, we must not be dependent upon rogue states and states that wish to use their power to determine our future policy. And that independence has an insurance premium cost, but it's a cost we would be right to bear. Um, just, just maybe if I could add on the... On the planning point, uh, by design, by being smaller, we've, we've tried to maximize the amount of activity that's conducted inside a factory, and that includes the work on site, where we build a site factory. That helps us be isolated from wind and rain, but it also hugely isolates the community from the construction activity. So we think that also by the SMR uh, features, we can make a stronger case, and if you consider that is on an existing nuclear site where the NDA has had a reactor for the last 50, 60 years, there's a really compelling case for a more interventionist approach by government to determine this is where, this is what will go where when uh, in terms of SMRs. And that, I think that will help, A, unlock capital, but also then allow us to get faster on the grid. I think a specific thing that would help on consenting is if the Environment Agency and the whole DEFRA family had a net zero duty so that and let's say an energy security duty so that so that individual decisions on species protection are balanced against the national need for protection of the environment through more low carbon electricity production and perhaps just to extend that point as well i mean i think bringing bringing that family together with a single person charged with decision making ultimately i think would also benefit greatly uh, to the floor again, we have, um, to the back, we have a gentleman with the pink tie, and then across from him in the uh, red and black. Thank you. I'm Mike Starkey, the directly elected mayor of Copeland, which encompasses the Calder Hall facility, which was the UK's first civil nuclear power station. You know, I, I represent a community where there's huge support that is, in fact, crying out for new nuclear. Uh, and, you know, the question I'd like to pose to the, the Secretary of State is, you know, what the time scale you foresee where you will purchase an SMR and what do we need to do to make sure that we get that sited in Copeland on the Sellafield site? I'm Ed Pitt, <coughs> Ed Pitt Ford. I'm a councillor in Westminster. Um, I'm a big believer in free markets and solar and wind. Uh, solar is following the cost curve of computer chips, so it's getting very, very cheap. It already is. By 2040, it'll be five times cheaper than the Hinkley strike price. Uh, so how, when there's that much solar and wind on the grid in 2040, will you either turn off the nuclear power stations or get rid of that excess energy that the taxpayer will be paying for? Uh, so we have two questions on timing to purchase an SMR and its competitiveness with renewables. Secretary, would you care to start? Uh, yeah, well, uh, certainly. I mean, I, I think um, we must have an immediate conversation between you and Rolls Royce as to whether a site can be developed and whether. I mean, look, I'm unfortunate. I wish I were in the position to say done and dusted now. I'm not. I think that would be exceeding my power as a Secretary of State. But I'm really keen to get this project going. If you've got a site, Rolls Royce has a scheme. Let's see if we can get something done. Well, I, I mean, I can't. It, there needs to be a competitive process. It needs to be fair and properly done, et cetera, et cetera. And that, I mean, that's genuinely important. Taxpayers' money would be at stake. But, you know, this sounds to me as if we've almost got a deal, if we can just make it work properly. Um, the sun doesn't shine, the wind doesn't blow. 
that's the problem. So, so uh, however cheap solar is, when the sun doesn't shine or at night, where are you getting your electricity from? It, it depends. St st and, and all that free storage will come from people's electric vehicles, which they've bought anyway. It'll be an Airbnb of storage around the country. Up to a point, Lord Copper. I mean, I'll, 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 there may be some element of that, but we need a base supply of energy that we can be certain of, rather than, I think that's a bit of a, 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 a wish upon a star that that will all happen. There may be elements of it, but will everybody have their cars plugged in at the right time and draw off that? Will that be the locatable storage that you need when the wind isn't blowing? And what, what happens if you have a cold but still spell? What do you do then in the winter when there's not much sun, people use their cars to drive? It, it, you, you need a base supply. It's, I think it's very unlikely that we won't continue to need a base supply, but we certainly do for the foreseeable future. And by 2050, well, 2050 is a long way off. Tom, what's the uh, best case scenario, everything goes right, when can we get a Rolls-Royce SMR on the ground? Well, we, we, we know the community in, in West Cumbria really well. I spent four years trying to deliver large nuclear in, in West Cumbria, so with the, we know the support that's up there and the site adjacent to and uh, north and south of Sellafield is perfect. They've got a very, very strong uh, community and a, and a very vocal MP who's pushing for that. We've now just recently identified a developer entity from West Cumbria who's trying to create a community-led solution to creating a, a developer-led response up there that wants to work with us. Um, and we're, we're, we are actually, I think, to, to use the Secretary of State's uh, phrase, we are close to pulling a deal together. We've been working with the NDA uh, for some months, exploring across a number of their sites where we could deploy our SMR fastest. Uh, and I think No West Cumbria is definitely uh, in that space. And, and as, as Mike says, has got huge local support, skills, talent, and capabilities. And the other thing we can, we can also bring, not just to West Cumbria, but wherever else we build these SMRs, is it provides then a local source for either you know, local low-cost power or free power in those communities or district heating, but with the cost point at which we're bringing baseload power to those communities, excess megawatts or SMRs could attract data center companies, hydrogen production companies, other energy intensive users that could then feed off the SMRs. I'm sure, I'm sure EDF are looking at similar things at their sites as well. So there is a, a secondary benefit to those communities that do uh, want to host and welcome an SMR solution. I think, that, I, mean, I think that's the answer to your question, is that you need to make sure that the nuclear can operate flexibly by making sure that it can offtake heat. So we are planning to have valves so that we can offtake heat so it doesn't go to the turbines to make electricity and by making sure that it's configured for non-grid uses of electricity so we work in harmony with renewables you know we would love to co-power hydrogen electrolysis with the renewables projects on the Suffolk coast and then it's obviously going to be for a future system operator to call on what, what it needs for the grid and what it doesn't need for the grid can go into hydrogen uh, to the floor uh, up front here and as well over here Thank you. Yeah, David Landon, I'm CEO of Maltex Energy. So it's a UK-based company developing molten salt reactor technology. First of all, great to hear the Minister's support for nuclear. That's wonderful. Great to hear the good progress of both EDF and Rolls-Royce. My question is, how do, we, how do we go about supporting the other sort of SMR, AMR technologies, advanced nuclear technologies that are being developed, which potentially offer all sorts of benefits in terms of cost and flexibility over and above some of the pre-existing technologies. Thank you. Uh, I'm Chairman Chen, a Green Conservative from Hong Kong. And uh, according to Japanese, the Japanese nuclear power plant engineer, Hirai Nor Norio, accidents happen in any nuclear power plant on a daily basis. So, and, uh, and also, um, the, the, the radioactivity uh, from the toxic waste of any nuclear plant uh, will last for thousands of years. And, and also, uh, World War III is imminent. So what if Putin bombarded the nuclear power plants of our country? And uh, so my question uh, is for um, Mr. Secretary of State. Uh, so why, why doesn't uh, the, the UK government invest more 
uh, in uh, wind power and public uh, transport. And now, now almost uh, every household in, in the UK owns one or more private cars. Uh, th this is not, not good for, for, for the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so two questions, one on competition for uh, alternative SMR models, and two on how do we make the safest source of energy even safer, and I know we have plans for that. Secretary. Um, thank you. I'm really interested in a competitive market, and therefore other technologies. Um, we, I don't know which technology is best. I don't know which one's going to work. I don't know which of the small modular reactors is going to be the one that really works and is the right size and so on. I think what we need to do is encourage all forms of technology and work with global partners. The UK market on its own probably isn't big enough to test out lots and lots of different forms of nuclear power, but globally I think we can do that. And if molten salt is the answer, let's make molten salt the answer. I have no um, skin in the game of any particular technology, but will you come to my office and brief me fully on what the advantages of molten salt are? Because other people have come to brief me and I would love, I would love to know. Um, on on um, the, the question on nuclear safety, I'm going to divide this question in two parts. I'm going to ask the experts who are building nuclear power stations on all the steps that are taken to make them safe and secure, including from hostile attack from other nations, because that is a, an important part of it. On the part about people having any number of cars, you see, I think this is a fundamental philosophical difference. As a conservative and as a politician, I want people to lead the lives that they want to lead, and my job is to take the obstacles out of their way. If my voters want to have five cars each, then my job is to find a way where they can have five cars each and that that is possible. And if they want to have electric lighting on all night, it's my job to make sure that they can have their electric lights on all night. I'm not there to tell them to tighten their belts, not do things that they want to do, not enjoy foreign holidays, um, not, not lead their life to the full, and to recognize that they will have different choices in their life from the ones that I will have. It's not my job to lead people's lives for them. So if people want more than one car, that's up to them. We must provide the energy that allows people to do that. I, I've always really disagreed with the hair shirt approach to greenery. But actually, what we're showing today with nuclear energy is that you can have green energy in abundant quantities at an affordable level. And that means people can lead the lives they want to and be green. That must be a more attractive option than saying to people, you can't do this, you mustn't do that. That's not the politics that I'm in favor of. Um, Mark, can you tell us a bit more about some of the safety improvements that we can expect to see at Hinkley, especially following uh, the Fukushima and what we've learned from those experiences? So I think the first thing to say, and, and it's been commented on already, we have one of the most stringent regulatory environments in the world, in the UK, because of our history of dealing with nuclear. And that is a good thing, absolutely a good thing. It is also a goal-setting environment, and that drives us all to have the behaviour of constantly looking to be better. That's also a good thing. So we learn, we improve. When we look at these things, nuclear power plants plan for all hazards great deals of detail, down to one in 10,000 year events. And in terms of things that were learnt from, say, things like Fukushima that was mentioned, you then look even further beyond that to the things that maybe nobody would ever considered to say, well, what if it could happen? And so we plan for that as well. We have increased water sources, increased backup generation. Um, what's referred to as a, a core catcher for Hinkley, so you protect the environment from the fuel if the worst were to happen. All of these extra safety things are put in place exactly to plan for the things that nobody ever considered. Uh, and so I think those, you know, we always have to bear that in mind, but the benefits that have been described uh, are really all about having that low carbon energy and protecting the environment ultimately. And so I think you know, the, the last thing I'd say on this is, you know, it's back to being humble and learning all of the time and therefore always looking to be better. Uh, I'd like to go back to the floor for uh, one more set of questions before um, Lady in the Beige and uh, the fellow with the card up. Uh, 
Uh, hi, I'm Georgina Hines from the Nuclear Industry Association. My question is to the Secretary of State. Um, apologies. Um, <laughs> Great British Nuclear uh, submitted its recommendations at the start or middle of... That's really not very nice. I don't like <laughs> the zoom in on the face. Um, the start of <laughs> September or mid-September. Um, when are we next going to hear... Well, when, when is the announcement on next steps? Thank you very much, experts and Secretary of State. Raj and Semi, Office of Trudy Harrison, Member of Parliament for Copeland. To what extent do you believe that the government's new proposals of investment zones, bringing 40 new low-tax and relaxed planning areas around the country, will aid the rollout of nuclear either directly or in the circular economy? Thank you. Um, on the next announcement following the, the September deadline, I don't know when that will be finalised. Um, and I don't know if a date has actually been, been set. Um, some of my special advisors are in the room, and they will find an answer for you if you have a word with them, to, if, if there is a specific date. Um, investment zones are much broader than nuclear, uh, and um, I, I think investment zones, by their nature, would be much more likely uh, to uh, support small modular rather than large nuclear schemes. Um, the investment zones are not a means of getting around all planning regulations and all safety regulations, and I think people would be concerned if they thought that uh, they were an opportunity to um, get around them for nuclear. I, I am the most deregulatory person probably you could bump into, but I'm very keen on full regulation of nuclear. I don't want to take a single risk on nuclear, because if I do, you would undermine public confidence, and if you don't have public confidence, you will not have the nuclear build-out that we need. So um, it may help nuclear surprisingly little because it just is different. Now, I don't want the 240 regulations. I really don't. But I do want it to be absolutely safe and for people to maintain complete confidence. Um, as we approach, I think we can also have um, some closing remarks here. We have about uh, just over two years left in this government's mandate. Uh, what can uh, we hope to see from them that makes the UK a more attractive place to bring in investment? And what can they do to help uh, bring both large-scale and SMRs completed faster? What will be your wish list for this government uh, before the next election? Uh, can we start with you, Tom? Oh. Um, well, thank you. Um, open goal from a wish list perspective, given the Secretary of State's here. Um, but no, I think I, I would advocate that we've now got a domestic UK sovereign technology that we can export, and I think that is a big differentiate. We need to back this technology in the UK as quickly as we can so we can start the build cycle, we can start building the factories, we can contribute enormously to economic growth in this country if we get behind Rolls-Royce SMR and we can export this and create long-term sustainable factories and jobs all over the country. Mark? In terms of what else can we do? Um, I I mean, I think in terms, there are others that are better able to comment on the investment side than me as, a, as, as an engineer and these sort of things. So I focus very much on the how do we get them built side of things rather than necessarily the investment. <laughs> uh, any recommendations on uh, good specific reforms we can make and uh, where it does make sense to streamline while maintaining the safety standards we expect from the sector? I think, um, you know, we come back to with when we've talked about our, whether it's 240 or 140, I think it's how we pick that balanced route through those things effectively um, and that faster decision making on those elements. Uh, Julian? Well, I'd just say I mean, fully support, obviously, the need to maintain public confidence and, and we have no complaint at all about nuclear regulation, but to focus on pace and streamlining the process so that we have a better balance between being able to build the infrastructure we need in order to protect the environment. And, Secretary, to you, what can the sector do to make your job a little bit easier to make sure that we can bring in that investment and we can get things done? What do you want to see the folks on this stage and their colleagues uh, take a better handle on? Oh, I think the sector is excellent. I mean, I, I, I think the nuclear sector is absolutely brilliant because um, they have worked away ensuring that our existing nuclear power stations are safe and secure. They have come up with engineering solutions to give us the next generation uh, at a point at which governments had ignored them for 20 years, and they've kept going. So, so I, I think that's absolutely fantastic. It is a great sector with lots of innovation in it. Um, I, I, I think it's really the government that needs to pull its finger out a bit. Uh, so the responsibility is mine. And having said 
um, I want to copy the French. I'm not going to say I want to copy the Germans. Um, uh, you never know who next. Um, uh, on this um, 10 years to 10 months in getting things done. You, you, you can get things done faster without any loss of safety. And the absolute case in point of this is the MHRA over the vaccine, where they got things that normally take months done in hours slash days without any loss of safety. And that's the approach that we need to take. It's not that you remove all the safeguards. You just go through them quickly. You come to the same answer in the end, but you save years and billions in the process. That's the bit that is my challenge uh, over the next um, two years or so uh, until the next election. Thank you very much, Secretary. Um, I'd like to thank our guests for uh, joining us today, our esteemed panel, and in particular, uh, Julia and Sizewell C. for their generous sponsorship of the event. Uh, thank you for joining uh, Policy Exchange today, and we hope you stick around for a few more of our panels. Please give us a warm round of our applause for our esteemed guests. <laughs>